some of you asked me how I made this 3D city animation a few videos ago. Now this is actually the same code I used to make Yoyal City from the episode BFDIA 5E, which you can check out in the link in the description. I've already made two behind the scenes videos showing all the stages of production along the way, which are also in the description, but this video is going to be more about the actual process of designing the city rather than how I coded it. In other words, say I make this code open source and you download it and want to make your own city. How do you go about doing that? That is what this video is all about. So let's get started. The folder is called Yoyal City Words, and inside the data folder is where all the information is for how the city should be designed. The most important file is this image called bb.png. But regardless of what the image name is, here's the city blueprint, a map I guess. So you see it says Politicians United Nation right now, and that's because it was for a school project where you had to create a political party, and ours said pun. Because we were cringy like that, and yes we lost. Anyway, the map is a giant square that's miles across, and one region near the bottom, I guess the southern half of the map, will be where this rectangle is drawn. The red channel of every pixel tells you how many trees are allowed in that region. By trees, I mean wilderness trees, and these are trees that don't mesh well with the cityscape. So, we have to start with them at 100% red on the outside, and transition gradually to 0% red in the middle. Now this is more of a multiplier, and everything outside of this rectangle is at just one times multiplier, so that there's no seam in between the rural area and the urban area. The green channel tells you how urban that block is. By the way, a pixel equals one block. If a pixel has any amount of urbanity to it, there will be roads and buildings there. But the higher the urbanity, the taller the buildings will be. And the most urban pixel of them all will have the Yoyal Needy in it. Because the Yoyal Needy is the epitome of urbanity. But that means if you want a more natural looking city that doesn't have these hard edges, you just gotta create this nebulous blobby green region instead of these hard edges you see here. Pretty much to determine the shape of your city, you just draw it out in green. But it should be pure green if you want really tall buildings. So what is the end result of this all? Well that's when you actually have to go to processing, Yoyal City Words, and click run. Um, I'm not sure if this works on processing 2 or 3, because I wrote this back in 2013. Well actually, processing 2 already came out by then. But anyway, I only had processing 1, so it's written processing 1. It might work, but it might not. These two lines here for int full and int cam mode are the most important. If cam mode is zero, then you'll be able to interactively move the camera around as it's running, which lets you explore different regions of the city and all that, but it's not that great for recording. If cam mode is one, then the camera will stick to following a track that you predetermine around the city. It will also record every single frame as an image file, so at the end of it all, you'll have an image sequence that you can then turn into a video if you want to. By the way, here's the track that the camera follows in my most recent animation. It's pretty ugly, but you actually don't have to worry about these numbers too much, because what I usually do is set camera to zero, move the camera around, press a certain key so that it outputs the exact coordinates of that point, then I just copy that from the output and then paste it back into processing, then switch camera to one, and then start recording. Now int full tells the computer how high quality to draw the city. If full is zero, that is absolute lowest quality, and the computer will only draw one polygon per building and only 10 blocks out in any direction. If full is 2, that is full quality 100% and the computer will draw as much detail as possible. Unfortunately, because processing isn't really designed for complex 3D rendering, it will run at about 0.017 frames per second, so about 1 minute per frame, okay? So you do not want to be playing around with that unless you're rendering. Full equals 1 is about a middle ground between the two, medium quality. So it'll take about 3 to 5 seconds to render a frame, but you still want to restrict your actual movement of the camera to full zero. Of course, the seed variable just tells the computer what random seed to use, and if you don't like the way your city kind of looks, you can just change this and hope random chance gives you a better outcome. City location pretty much says what latitude the city's at, and this doesn't really need to be changed unless your city ends up underwater or something. Anyway, enough talking, let's see what it actually looks like. Now warning, because everything is just overloaded with so much detail, it takes a long time to start, it takes a long time to run, 
everything's just super slow. That's just what happens when you push processing to its limits. Oh, okay, so it's done. Okay, so it looks like it's been a white screen for like 10 seconds now. I can't remember if that was normal. Just be prepared for these really long waits. Oh, okay, there we go, now it's done. So, here we are. You can see the sky and there's the sun over there. You press... Hold on, I have to remember these controls. So, the arrow keys move you north, south, east, west. Makes sense, right? Space makes you move up. Shift makes you move down. And then if you want to change the rotation of the camera, you can do that with W, A, S, and D. So to summarize, arrow keys to move horizontally, space and shift to move vertically, and then W, A, S, D to change the direction of the camera. So now I'm looking straight down. Again, this is considered low quality because the buildings are all single polygons, and we can only see like 10 blocks, maybe 20 blocks in any direction. For some reason I made it also draw the cars at any distance too, but that's because cars were the most recent feature and I needed to see whether they were working at far distances as well. Some more controls include changing the sensitivity of movement. So often you'll think that moving west or east is too fast and you want to fine tune. Well, pressing F, G, H, J, K, and L will change the sensitivity of movement. After pressing L, this is how fast I move. It's pretty much fast to move across the city in a few seconds. K is about one third the speed of that. Okay, also this affects vertical movement too, so I gotta zoom in to show you a little bit more what I mean. So I'm at K right now, it's about a third the speed of L. J is about a third as fast as that. H is about a third as fast as that. G, and so on. So here's G, and here's F. F is the absolute slowest, and this is when you want to have a real close-up of a very small object and like slowly pan around it. And then to affect the speed of rotating the camera, we have more keys. Forward slash is the fastest rotation, period is the middle rotation, and comma is the slowest rotation. So that's nine keys just to change the sensitivity, but I think they're pretty important and they're pretty easy to understand. Next, sometimes you'll want to change the quality of the rendering as you're running it. That's actually really easy to do. They're the keys E, R, and T. E stands for easy, which is full equals zero, as you see now. R is the middle ground I was talking about, so let's point it downward. Um, I'm gonna press R now. Like I said, it's gonna take three to five, oh, I guess it takes less than three to five seconds. I think maybe what R does more than make it middle quality is it renders off into the distance forever. Yeah, so you can see infinitely far with R, but with E, you can't. Now for full-blown rendering, you're going to want to press T, which sets full to 2, but remember it's going to take about a minute to render, so let's press that now, and you'll see it freeze for a full minute. Whenever the computer is freezing and you want to change the modes by pressing any key of some sort, you have to hold down that key until a frame refreshes, because only once the frame refreshes will the computer detect the key press. Now this is really inconvenient, but it's just a fact that processing goes through all of void draw before it will look at any other functions. So you need to wait for that draw to finish, which in this case takes a minute, before it will even look at void key press. Another issue of that is that once the full quality image is rendered to the screen, it will instantly try to start drawing the second frame of that before you have a chance to press a key. So you might have to wait for two frames to render, or two minutes before you can have another shot. You can always close the program and start it again, but as I just saw, it takes over a minute to just start the program. So either way, you're gonna have to be waiting at least two minutes. Okay, there it is. This is the full-blown highest re resolution image, and you can see the trees on the ground have spheres for leaves, as they should. The buildings all have tons of windows. They all have names, titles. They've got roofs. This, the cars are fully modeled and all that. And this is what you would eventually save to an image file so that you could use it in a video or something. But yeah, even if I press E just to go back to the easy mode, it's going to take a long time. Can I just point out that even though the titles of these buildings are randomly generated, some of them make a lot of sense, like chil- Ugh, just at the wrong time. Well, one of them said children's center, on which I thought it sounded a lot like an actual building. So I guess if I haven't mentioned it earlier, I should mention it now. If you zoom out really far, you can see that the overall map of the city says Politicians United Nation, just as it did in that image. Oh, something's weird with the water. Oh, the water only draws in that small 10x10 region, just like the city only draws in that 10x10 region. Hey, check this out. This car is driving on the sidewalk. That is not allowed. And then whenever they make right turns, they always cut the corner. The car driving AI is like super simplistic and hacked together. 
I just wanted to make it look like there was some activity going on, like some movement, and I didn't care how accurate or realistic it was. So next, let's see what it looks like to actually toy around with the code and the data files to result in different cities. So I'm going to save this as, I'm going to rename it as BB old because it's the old version of the file. And then I'll edit it with, should I do paint? Should I just edit with paint or paint.net? I'll do paint because that's more lightweight. Let's start with a just a blank slate. Finally, okay. So now we just make it all black again so we have a black slate. The edges are supposed to be red, but they don't have to be. The only issue is if you have black right on the edges, then the wild trees will go right up to the border and then stop at these very stark borders. And it's, it'll be very clear that there's a rectangle and you don't want that. But for the purposes of just showing what's going on, it's okay if there are those borders. So let me just like fill in some red here. And then I'll go like this to show you what it looks like when wild trees permeate into the city. Actually, this isn't pure red, but that's okay because all that matters is the um, actual red channel. As long as there's red in this color, it'll work. Of course, if there were green in this channel, then that would be an issue because then buildings would also start popping up. And I don't know what would happen then. So actually, uh, let's fill this all in with red. Okay, good enough. You know, what? it'll look crappy, but whatever. And then I'll write hide. Okay, let's say we want our actual city, which is supposed to be pure green. Let's say we want to make it star shaped. Then we just draw a star right here. What if we want some suburban regions? Suburban. That would just be a slightly darker green, because the darker you get, the less urban it is, and the shorter the buildings will be. So there we go. Let's go like that. And let's say, um, suburb. Right there. I think that'll be good. I think we're good to go, so let's save that. And let's see if this works. I'm actually not quite sure if it will. But before we do that, I want to point out one more thing you can tinker with. If you go to colors right here, you can see all these numbers. Those are the colors of the land at every elevation. So at the very mountaintop, which I didn't show you, but I will soon, the land is grayer and whiter because it's stone and snow. Whereas further down, it'll be greener because it's grass. And then further down than that, you'll get sandy colors because it's supposed to be a beach. But let me just prove that you can change this to whatever you want. This number right here, that's green. This is pretty clearly green. So that must be where most of the city is lying. If I change this to pure magenta, let's see if we can get a magenta colored city. Let's click run now, and if everything's working, which to be honest, I'm not sure if it is. Is this recording? Yeah, it is. I'm not sure if it is. We should both get a city with magenta regions in it, where it's at like this elevation, as well as this weird layout with a star-shaped city, um, this red snaking path of trees, and these suburbs that actually spell suburb. Let's see if it happens. So in the like minute that it takes to open up this program, what it's doing is it's assigning the positions of all the buildings, all of the trees, all of the traffic lights and all of that. And that's in a giant array list. Like it's huge. It's got thousands, if not millions of objects. So that's why it's so slow. Moment of truth. Okay, so first of all, the grass looks green. So it looks like I didn't affect the right elevation. Okay, I see some. There's a star. Do you see it? There's a star. Okay, let me um, increase the speed of movement. So there's a star. Okay, hold on just a second. While the star turned out correctly, the borders of the image, which are supposed to be red, which means a lot of trees, actually have cars in it. But this is underwater. It has cities in it. Oh, I think it's because the red? Is it because it had a little bit of green in it? Hold on, let me just check. This color here, it's got 28 greens in it, okay? So if you have any greens at all, buildings will be drawn, so you need to set that to zero if you don't want any buildings there. By the way, the coast of the water is completely unpredictable and determined by the seed. So if you find part of your city underwater that you don't like, then just change the seed and hope for a better outcome. Another thing you can do is change the city location variable, which is, like I said, the latitude of the city. So if the city is too far south and in the water, just move it up a bit. In E mode, where full equals zero, it's low quality, the land colors that I have set in the array actually don't affect it at all, and it's always set so that city land is gray, and natural land is this dark greenish color. So the colors of the array won't show through unless you're at full equals 1 or 2. So hopefully, when the full fully rendered image shows up, I will see the magenta colored grass. Yep, there it is, magenta colored grass. Okay, so I reverted back to the Politicians United Nation image, 
just to see whether the red channel was working after all, because I never actually went to the outskirts of the city. Okay, there we go. Ignore the pink grass because I set that and you already understand how that works. See these wilderness trees on the side? They are not individual trees, they're just a big fluffy green mass and from afar it looks pretty convincing. But you can see how as you get closer to the city, they sink further and further into the ground. Which kind of hides the fact that there's a rectangular um, image being superimposed on top of them because you can't see the actual border of that image. Now another thing I want to show you is what the whole thing looks like from really far up high above. Now I do have to warn you, there is fog that's being applied to this landscape. Fog is usually applied if the computer doesn't have the power to draw all the tiles at once. So with fog it can get away with only drawing the most nearby ones. However here, I don't care about frame rate as you saw, like I'm willing to go down to one frame a minute. Um, so it's actually still drawing every single tile. So the only reason I have fog at all is for atmospheric reasons. To make it look like the city is actually spanning miles of distance. Because if the other side of the city looks like it's covered with a bluish haze, that just makes you think that the city is massive. Which is what I wanted the viewers to think. Okay, I think that should be good. And now I'll press T. And what's interesting is that even though I'm looking at the entire city, it shouldn't be any slower to render than normal because all of these city blocks would have to be rendered anyway. So it should still be about a minute to render. Now, if you're rendering an image sequence that's at 30 frames per second, that means for a second of the final output, it will take 30 minutes if your computer is about the same speed as mine. But what that means is that when I let it run overnight, that's about eight hours of computation time. I did this, wait no, I didn't do it in school, but if I were in school, that would kind of give me an, an extra 8 hours where I wouldn't be using my computer anyway, so that's 16 hours of time for the computer to render. How many seconds of final animation can it produce in that time? Well 16 hours is about a thousand minutes, and it's convenient because you got a minute per frame, so you get about a thousand frames. At 30 frames per second, that's only 30 seconds of animation. But that means across a night, including school, you would get about 30 seconds of 30 frames per second animation. So here we go. Actually, I kind of like this color scheme. Like, the, the magenta looked really bad up close, but when it's combined with the bluish haze, it, it's this very gentle purple twilight feeling to it, and I, I like it a lot. So as you can tell, the image is about at this range, and you can clearly see the gradient from full-on trees down to nothingness. So what I should do is go with pure red. So do you hear that people who want to create their own maps? If you want to have regions with trees, make it pure red or some shade of pure red, some multiple, so like go like that, okay? You don't want to have any green because that messes things up because green means city and I guess they just don't collide very well. Now I know there's all the anti-aliasing issues but if the if it gets the stuff in the middle correct, then it should be fine. Actually, you know what, I'll just draw over it, I'll, I'll scribble. I could go into paint.net and actually mess with the filter so that all the green is removed, but then it, that would mean I'd have to open paint.net, which I don't want to do. Okay, good enough, let's give it a shot. Moment of truth, guys, here we go. I can see the, the beginning of the star already. I hate how it always puts me underground. There's the star, and I can see that the red regions above and around it no longer have suburbs in them, like they shouldn't. So that's good, it means it worked. That's why I expected to see specks all over the place, of pixels I forgot to cover. But for the most part it worked, and you can see that the red regions now do have trees in them, which is what's supposed to happen. Here's the suburb. Um, if you look closely, the suburb will only have short buildings, because it's such a dim green. See how short they all are? Because that would be stupid. Oh, it's done. Can you see how short the buildings are? Maybe the camera isn't close enough, but these are still certainly suburbs. Now here's the thing that's like confusing me, right? This is a very sloped landscape, yet there are these community pools where you can go swimming. Some of them are on pretty steep surfaces and yet the water isn't spilling over. It's defying gravity, what the heck? Oh, actually, if you want your city to render faster, you could actually probably get it by just- Okay, that's done. You could probably get it by just having fewer pixels that have big buildings in them, because I think the biggest thing that slows down drawing is just how many windows there are and big buildings have tons of windows. The tallest buildings in the suburban region only have four or so stories. On a sloped landscape, the buildings look taller in front because they need to have at least that many stories in back. Like, there can not be any windows underground. So you can see these really ridiculously tall doors. And if you don't like that look, that means you want your cities to be flatter, where the bottom of the building in the back is about the same as the bottom of the building in the front. And I'll show you how to do that soon. Anyway, some of the attractions you'll find in suburbia include a Yoyo Trade Factory, Private Corner, Candy Dungeon, Penny for Life, Hour for You, New and Improved Factory, Clothing World, 
Money Inc, Egg Corner. They must sell a lot of eggs. Let's compare this to the city now. So we're gonna head over from Suburbia. I'm gonna press L so I move it faster. Go to the Star, which is the most city-like place in the world. Oh, look at that. Look at that. A single block surrounded by forest. If a pixel has any green in it, the greenness will overwrite the redness. That's how it works. Hey, there's a car there. That car will just go around forever. Isn't that sad? Okay, now it's gonna drive into, into the woods underneath all the trees, but it's gonna come out and just go around that block forever. Well, actually, the people inside of the cars, even if they're not trapped in this tiny block, will still be driving forever because the cars never stop. But this one just it takes it to the next level of sad. There it is, there it is. Let's see what this block looks like in full resolution. Okay, there we go. I keep forgetting about the magenta grass. Here we have our secluded little town, um, hopefully self-sustaining because it would be very difficult to get supplies here if there are no roads connecting it. And they just live their lives in this tiny little world with only about 10 or 15 buildings to entertain themselves, and that's all they know the world to be. be I can't remember if it takes up four city blocks or one. Oh, I hope it's not underwater. That would suck. Okay, there's a bunch of cars that are just driving underwater. I don't... Wait, hold on. These cars aren't driving underwater, they're driving on the water. I'm not sure how that even came to be because I just programmed the cars to stick to the elevation of the land they were driving on, so why would they be floating on top of the water when the elevation is clearly below that? But you know what that proves? Cars have a density of like, 5 or something, that's just a guess. But that means that the fluid, whatever it is here, must have a density of greater than 5. So this city must be situated next to a pool of liquid mercury. That's the only answer to why this is happening. Billions and billions of gallons of mercury are like seeping into their grass all the time. That's so unhealthy for the children. Okay, I give up, but maybe if I just have a wide shot of the whole star like this and I press T, maybe I'll be able to see it. Okay, there we go. There's the star and it looks like city blocks don't draw if they go into the water, but cars will still drive there. But there's the Yoyal Needy in the most northern tip. I don't know why I didn't see it before. I guess it just doesn't draw in low quality mode. But yeah, you can see that even from this far distance, the buildings in the city region are just so much taller than in the suburbs, which you can see back here. In addition to that, you can see the red snaking path of trees that goes over here. Now remember, the redness is a multiplier of tree density. And then you can also see the pixels of half red that I didn't quite cover up with my red brush because they made it through, show that they still had a little bit of green and then produce city block. The program will also randomly generate these bridges in between the two. You can't really control that. If you don't like the way the bridges were constructed, just get a different seed. But then one last thing I want to show you is how to make the city flatter as well as the camera animation keyframe stuff actually working because that might be the most important part. So I'll close this now. Actually, it's faster if I just click stop here. So let's make it flatter. First of all, I don't like that magenta grass anymore. Let's try a different color. Let's go with pure black because they live on like asphalt or something. Okay, I found it. The variable is called slope. Slope is just an elevation multiplier. I don't know why I called it that. I'll put it at the very top so that everyone can find it more easily. So what it means is that with a slope of 120, the highest point of the map will be 120 city blocks above the lowest point. If you want a perfectly flat city, you can put zero, though I don't know if that's going to cause division by zero errors somewhere down the line, so I'm just going to put in one for now, and you'll see a very flat city. In addition, let's change up the map a bit. Let's have a differently shaped city. I've always liked those images that artists have drawn of circular cities, so let's make ours concentric circles. Let's start with the very center being the most intense urban city center ever, like that. Then we'll go outward with dimmer and dimmer shades of green. Let's have a little gap in between to make it more clear that the rings are there. Let's have a ring of vegetation in between the layers. So there's our ring of vegetation. Then I'll go even dimmer like that. Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's see how that looks. Clearly my circles were not that neat, but it doesn't need to be geometrically perfect. I think you'll be, still be able to see the circular formation. Okay, there we go. The part of it's gonna be underwater actually. Hold on, let me check. Yeah, part of it's underwater. Let's move it further north. So to move it further north, I'll just change this to 108 to say, 84. And remember, this isn't a flat world. Well, before it would have moved up the mountain, now that mountain doesn't really exist, so it's just gonna move further northward. Okay, I see the circles, I see the circles. Now if we look downward, even the largest ring doesn't even get to the water here, which is what I wanted. So you can see how flat the whole thing is, right? Very flat. But the variable slope was merely a multiplier, which means that the bands of elevation color, of land color based on elevation, will still show up, so that when I made the grass black, you'll still see that. Let's take a far out shot. Okay, that ought to be good. I think that should capture the whole circle. Now it's going to render, and we're going to see a pretty naturally colored landscape, except for 
this black band of grass going through it because I set the grass color at one elevation to be black. And on top of that, we'll see these concentric circles of city blocks. There we go. It's exactly what I expected. The tallest buildings in the center and then they go out from there. There's the vegetation bands. I want to point out that you can still see the snow and the stone colored land at the top because those are still at 90% and 100% elevation of normal. Also, you can see the very, very clear border of the image that's being imposed on top of the forests. But this gets the general concept across, right? Like you can very clearly see this circular city and it looks pretty nice. Bridges between city blocks can only be a maximum of 10 blocks long, I think. I could probably change that if I wanted to. But you can see that because of that, I drew the outer two rings a little closer together so that there is the occasional bridge between the two. And same with the middle point and then the, the first ring, there are bridges between those. But the first ring and the second ring are completely separated, which is pretty sad. It means that there isn't one city here, there's two cities. Here's what the city looks like. Here's a shot of what the city looks like from the very center. You can see the hub of the whole city in the lower left and then the bands coming out from that. And it is just so flat. To be honest, I'm not used to this flatness. Also the um, vegetation trees will also be extremely flat because they are merely multiplied off of the slope variable. So if I wanted to fix that, I could by increasing the variable that determines the height of the trees. Also, I just want to warn you, this city has way more city blocks than the typical one. So it took way more than a minute to render. I think it took about like a minute and 40 seconds or something. That does just prove that the more city blocks you have, the longer it will take to render. I gotta move that cursor out of the way. Don't want to have this beautiful shot ruined by that. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you before ending this video is how to create the keyframe animation thing so that you can have your camera automatically moving across the city. Now you may remember from the animation a few videos ago of that little robot that was kind of the mascot of our political party. Um, and it was just scrolling through the city. So where is it? Actually, I don't remember. Maybe it's near this eye. Unfortunately, the robot has no custom ability, so you can't change its path or position unless you actually go into the hard-coded numbers that I have in there, which kind of is bad programming, but whatever. You can, however, go into the data file and change the images themselves, which will make it so that the robot has a different appearance. Oh, I think I found it. I found it. Look at that. I found it. There it is. So cute. Oh, actually, the koala was our mascot, which is why there's a koala on the side. Ooh, there it is. Okay, let's find the front of it. Now you may have noticed it's not actually moving, and I'll explain why. So, this mode in which full equals zero and the buildings are only single polygons, that's just for your messy camera work, for like deciding where the camera's gonna go. Well, every time you want to record a keyframe for the camera, you press either C or V, I can't remember. Let's press V. Yeah, V. Okay, so now if you look at the output of the processing file, it has this array of about nine numbers that tells the computer exactly where the camera is, where it's pointing, and its rotation, and all that. So after pressing V a bunch of times, like moving the camera and then pressing V, moving the camera again and pressing V... Why is it moving every time I press V? Oh, I can explain that later. So every time you press V, it records a keyframe. And when you press V, it adds 1.5 seconds in between the last one and the current one, so that in the actual animation, the camera takes time to move between the two points. And that's why when you look at the robot, when you press V, it moves forward a little bit because that's exactly how far forward it's going to move in 1.5 seconds. So V is what I just explained. It adds 1.5 seconds in between the two keyframes and adds a new one. Oh, those two cars just collided, but they don't care. If you press C, it does exactly the same thing, but it doesn't add any time in between the two keyframes. So if I press it, now if you look down here, it added another keyframe, but it's still at 16.5 seconds in the timeline. And that's if you want to do a cut, which is why you press C, C for cut. Also, you notice the camera doesn't move that time. So you can see actually the robot's moving forward ever so slowly, and that's because that's how far it moves in a single frame. When you press V, and it adds 1.5 seconds in between keyframes, why is the camera also moving? To explain that, I need to explain how the camera interpolates motion in between two keyframes, it doesn't just do the standard linear motion because every time it would hit a point and change direction, it would be a jarring instant acceleration kind of thing and it would not be very pleasant to watch because of that. So I use spline interpolation between the two points, which means I have a cubic function that goes through all the keyframe points of the path smoothly so that acceleration is gradual. 
and that's much more enjoyable to watch because it feels much more like you're being flown around like on the wings of a bird going around all over the place. Now because of that, when you plan the path of your camera using V, you don't want the distances between your keyframes to vary a whole ton because if it's like you're moving 100 meters between the first two keyframes and then a single meter between the next two, the spline interpolation is going to try very hard to keep acceleration the same, which is going to result in very wonky behavior. The spline interpolation will work much better if the distances between the keyframes is about the same, because then it kind of just connects the dots in a smooth path instead of having to do all these loops to keep acceleration gradual. So, when you press V, it will measure the delta change of the last two keyframes before that, add that again so that pressing V gives you constant movement between keyframes. And so if you do want to change the motion of the camera, you just add on to that so that the acceleration is still kind of gradual. It's pretty much giving you a suggestion of where the next keyframe should be so that the camera movement is as smooth as possible. That's why the camera work in both Yoil City in BFDI A5E and the animation I did for my government class looks so good. It's because it's all really smooth and not only that but the computer also gave me suggestions for the keyframe so that it would be smooth as possible. So I think that's really all I need to talk about for the movement. You can see I'm already up to 45 seconds, 46 seconds here so I probably shouldn't try recording this because that would take forever. But that's pretty much it. You just press V every time you want a new keyframe and see if you want a new keyframe but you don't want to have any time delay in between the last two. I was thinking about a different key like maybe Y that would draw just one frame of the high quality image. Oh no, it would save that to a screenshot. And then right after doing just one frame of that, it would instantly go back to easy mode. Because then you would only need to wait one minute. Um, but I'm not sure if I ever implemented that. And also, if you were viewing that as a viewer, after the really high quality image was drawn right there, it happened right at the exact moment, since the easy image would be drawn instantly after that, you would not see it. You would see it for a split second and it would flash away. But if it's saved to a screenshot, then that doesn't matter. Actually, this is a pretty nice view. So you can see the bridges between what I think are the T and I regions, and it looks pretty nice, right? So you can see these, these trees. And yes, in this region, some trees are pink, because I really liked the aesthetic when I made Yoyo City. And you can also see what kind of business is driving the economy in these cities, because you've got the super elite market over here, prisoner's food, which probably doesn't taste very good, and I don't even know why a prisoner would be out and about buying food in a grocery if they're in a prison. We've got a battle house. What would you even do in a battle house? School apartment. Okay, that sounds, that's like a boarding school, and that's like torture. Bowling something. It's really fun to just look around because there's like 40,000 combinations of titles there could be, so you'll always see something new. But I'd also like to point out all the little features of the city that might not be that noticeable, but I hope at least add to the atmosphere so that you feel like you're actually in a city if you're down on the city block. We've got a bunch of Yoyal flags. By the way, I designed the Yoyal flag keeping all the five laws of vexillology in mind, you know, like simplicity, bold symbols, and all that. <laughs> but like, these people are super patriotic because on every block, there's like five of them. We've also got traffic lights. There's one right there, which is pretty small. Um, and they're randomly placed around the block. All that's required is that they're adjacent to an actual street. So sometimes you can find blocks with multiple traffic lights on a single block, some of them spaced in between intersections, not at intersections, but in between them, which makes no sense. We've also got street lights and telephone poles. Here's a single telephone pole and here's another one. If we find a spot where two telephone poles are close enough, it will actually draw a wire in between the two. Now one of the reasons that this renderer is so slow at high quality is because it will draw every single block across the whole city in every frame. So it doesn't know what's in frame and what's out of frame. So even though we're looking at the T and I regions of the city, it's drawing all the city blocks, all the traffic lights, all the street signs, and all that in the P-O-L-I-T regions, all that as well. And that's why it's so slow. Um, so there we go, now we're in fast mode again. My brother told me, and he's probably right about this, that if I were to create this in a program that was actually designed for large-scale 3D renderings, then it could render the city in high-quality mode at like 60 frames per second, using a lot of optimization techniques, and I should have done that. But it seems to be a common habit of mine to learn one tool, such as processing, enough that I feel at home when I'm using the user interface, and then just keep pushing it to its limits, and then do everything in that environment. It's what I did with um, Camcorders in 2005, it's what I did with Stagecast in 2007, Flash in 2009, and then now Processing. So I guess I'm just not very versatile, I, I like only know 
a very few environments well, but where I do know them well, I think I try to use them to the highest capability they, that they've got. I mean, looking at like open processing, I feel like this is not what processing was designed for, and um, I'm like really overloading it. Okay, there we go. It looks like we're a little too close to the street to see much of anything, including the street wires, the telephone wires that I wanted to see. But you can see on the left, there are tons of traffic lights all over the place. But I also like how the different types of trees really make it feel like the foliage is extending into the street region. And it really makes the city feel alive. I'm really liking this atmosphere. So we'll start with um, a keyframe on the west side. Keep the output open so that you know what's going on. I'll have it over here. Press. Well, um, if you don't want to have any cuts, I think cuts cause some issues with the splining and all that. So I'll just stick with pressing V. So I'll just press V. So, so now we've got a keyframe right here. Um, now I'll move the camera a bit and I'll turn here. Press V again. And remember it's going to extrapolate. That's the word. It'll extrapolate the path so that this is where I should go next if I want to have the least acceleration of the camera. But I want to like swoop across the um, city center. So I'm going to do that. So now I'm at the city center. And I want to like get really close to the ground here. Oh, that's a little too close. V again. Now I'm underground, of course, but if I move up a bit like that, then I'll be fine. Oh, I didn't press V. Oops. V. And then if I look up, V. Then I'm going to turn around. This is a r rather jarring movement, the last one, turning around and pressing V again. And then, oh, array out of bounds exception. That's never good. Oh, ignore this array index out of bounds exception. It won't happen when you run it because I'll implement a fix. Uh, but for right now, I've got all the frames I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this output. Only the arrays though, not the other stuff that it outputted. Stop it. Now I'm going to go to the variable camcore which has the coordinates of all the keyframes of the last animation. I guess I'll keep those just in case I ever, I ever want to bring them back. I'll comment them out. And I'll paste in the ones I just recorded right here. Delete the last comma because you can't end it with a comma. Now, you go up to that variable, cam mode, change it to 1. That means the camera will now, now follow those keyframes that we just inputted. If you want it to be a full-on render, then you're going to press 2 for full, but I want it to run at a reasonable speed so that you can see it, so I'm going to set it to zero. And then also, usually when cam mode is one, it'll save all the images as frames, but that'll make it slower, and I want to show you what it looks like right now. So I'm going to comment out the save frame command. Although, if you are rendering something, you do want to save the frames. So now it'll look like this. Here we go, get ready for the most epic cinematic experience of your life. Okay, there we go, see the camera started on the west side as it should have. Now it's going towards the center, it should dive down into this, in the hub in the center. Okay, got a little frozen. Okay, actually I was a little offset there, but that's okay. Okay, it went underground there. In the process of interpolating between keyframes using splines, you can often end up with a path that goes outside of the range of just the frames. Okay, so it turned around right there, as I thought it would. Oh, then there's the same error. So you just gotta be aware of that, and add a little bit of leeway, experiment a bit. But that's all for this video, and I might have the source code in the description, I might not, I don't know. But that is my 3D city drawer, and I think it's pretty fun. So thanks for watching, and goodbye. And golf ball.